Whether it's throwing a particular style of visual into just about anything they get their hands on, or not being able to help themselves when utilizing a game-changing tool, these directors just keep doing whatever the hell they want, even if it means leaning into what many ultimately hate about their filmography. I'm Gareth from WhatCulture.com, and here are 10 movie directors who effing double down on your hate. Number 10. It's always the end of the world for Roland Emmerich there's something to be said about a director who simply does not give a toss about how their movies are received, or how precise the science used in their big screen offerings is when all is said and done. In short, as Roland Emmerich has put it himself, this director is a filmmaker, not a scientist. And boy, does it show. With the director's features not exactly overflowing with rich dialogue, ever-twisting narratives, or even logical character developments for the most part, the over-reliance on CGI-heavy and often nonsensical set pieces in Emmerich's flicks has have become almost a parody of themselves at this point. Perhaps most hilarious is the fact that Emmerich confessed 2012 would be his last quote-unquote action disaster movie. For those keeping score, Independence Day Resurgence hit theaters in 2016, with Moonfall, a movie about the moon getting a little too close for comfort, set to collide with audiences next year. Emmerich knows you're sick of watching the world tediously burn, but you can kiss his moon if you think he's stopping anytime soon. Number 9. George Lucas wants the whole world to be a little more computer-generated Remember that time when George Lucas saw your criticism of his prequel Star Wars features and decided that the only logical next step was to fully overload his original trilogy with CGI? Ah, <laughs> good times. And while it must be said that not every alteration made to Lucas's first set of features was unwelcome, there were moments when the iconic filmmaker got a little too trigger happy. But it didn't matter if you weren't the biggest fan of the prequel's VFX stuff Clone Wars or a lack of Yoda puppetry, Lucas felt that this groundbreaking tool was the only way going forward. So fans were soon exposed to everything from excessive fake rocks blocking R2-D2 to massive, now clunky as all hell, Ronto's booking in the middle of Moss Eisley, with that latter piece of 1997 tinkering being used as a way to apparently excite viewers about the technology that would be on show in the then-incoming prequels. It most definitely did not, and it subsequently didn't stop Lucas from going back to the CGI well with his old flicks a few more times over the years. Number 8. Terence Malick's Obsession with Tall Grass Shows No Sign of Stopping of the many directors known for imbuing a specific visual style into pretty much all of their features, few garner the sort of divisiveness of Terence Malick, a filmmaker who will stop at nothing to ensure his movie contains a shot of his characters wading through some aesthetically pleasing tall grass. Now, this is hardly the only key characteristic that Malick refuses to steer away from when bringing a new project to life, with his highly distinct and immersive angles when crafting a shot also being a key trait within his features. But despite it becoming something of a running joke just how often his actors wind up sitting amongst the flowing grass, eating cereal or just sprinting through a field, Malik still finds a way to get some raised greenery into his creations. In fact, Malik is so obsessed with cultivating a catalog of visually stunning grassy roots that he was once sued for forgetting to make a documentary he'd signed on to create. The reason? He was too busy shooting the likes of Tree of Life becoming immersed in the weeds when he should have been planting seeds for what would eventually become Voyage of Time. Number 7. Nobody else gets to play with Ridley Scott's Alien For a time, it looked as though the Alien franchise was set to receive the shot in the arm it had been in desperate need of, when District 9's Neil Blomkamp announced he'd be helming a new Alien project in 2015. But then, a certain director who himself had just cheekily unveiled a soft prequel to what he clearly felt was his baby had other ideas. Hot on the heels of the divisive but no less intriguing Prometheus, Ridley Scott decided to double down on officially bringing another Alien movie into the world, subsequently killing off Blanc Kemp's outing. Scott's alien covenant would eventually meander into theaters, hardly setting the world on fire in what was a failed attempt to remind folks why he was the man to guide this horrifying IP into the future. Though Scott has since gone on record to defiantly confess that he has another alien project in development, news of an alien TV show run by Fargo's Noah Hawley seems to suggest control of his prized alien is being slowly wrestled away. But ever the antagonist, it'll never be as as good as the first one is all Scott had to say about that development. Number 6. Tim Burton Likes His Movies Dark With A Side Of Johnny Depp Few filmmakers have become as equally synonymous with a style of filmmaking as they are with an on-screen collaborator, like Tim Burton is with dimly lit stories starring old pal Johnny Depp. 
For a time, it felt as though Burton couldn't even conceive the notion of telling a notably darker and more gothic tale without a little help from the Pirates of the Caribbean star. But far from recapturing the lightning in the bottle that were their earlier gloomy hits together, see Edward Scissorhands and Ed Wood, the pair's later efforts have left a lot to be desired, with Dark Shadows in particular being a fiercely disappointing outing. But just when it seemed as though the penny had finally dropped for Burton, in terms of not relying on debt to anchor a project at least, news of the Batman director angling for Johnny to sign up for his Adams Family series Wednesday began doing the rounds. However, with Netflix reportedly slamming the brakes on this reunion, it looks like Burton's chance to double down once again with his longtime workmate has been buried already. Number 5. Michael Bay Doesn't Care If It Makes Little Sense As Long As Teenage Boys Are Happy it feels as though Michael Bay has somehow crafted a genre of his very own, that being films dedicated to blowing stuff up and asking questions later. Far from battling with those who slam Bay for being nothing more than a dude obsessed with throwing massive robots or rocks and Wahlbergs at each other for the bants, the director once claimed, I make movies for teenage boys, oh dear, what a crime, which tells you just about all you need to know about the movie maker's thought process when crafting a project. Within this aim to please the younger demographic comes a mesmerizing over-reliance on visually impressive but near incomprehensible set pieces, with the director also typically objectifying women and falling into racial stereotypes when filling his features with humans to be blown up and thrown around by whatever chaos is at the center of the action-packed feature in question. Number 4. Joss Whedon Can't Help But Lighten The Mood Alongside thoroughly sullying his reputation on the back of being accused of showing gross, abusive, unprofessional, and completely unacceptable behavior toward the cast and crew, by Ray Fisher whilst working on 2017's Justice League, Joss Whedon was also responsible for completely butchering that aforementioned film by trying to lace his trademark slapstick and other jarring comedy into the limp DCEU flick. After Whedon's first real stab at the mainstream superhero world, Avengers Assemble took the world by storm, it was safe to assume fans were in some what safe hands when the Buffy the Vampire Slayer creator was at the super wheel. However, it soon became apparent after Age of Ultron that Whedon was one of the major contributors to the MCU's incessant need to lighten the mood, with pointless comedy past the point of being welcome. And while this trait hasn't been completely eradicated in Whedon's absence from Marvel Studios, it at least hasn't ever been as prevalent as it was in the aforementioned Justice League, with Whedon seemingly hell-bent on smashing the more serious tone of Zack Snyder's previously shot work to pieces. Probably the least of his worries now though, right? Number 3. Quentin Tarantino Won't Shy Away From His Foot Fetish Quentin Tarantino has been accused of excessively cramming his features with a decent amount of jaw-dropping shots over the years, with most of the critique of his work being directed towards his penchant for extreme violence and language. But far from shying away from either of those controversial elements found in his work, Tarantino has continued on making the sort of films that challenge and compel his audience in equal measure. In another example of not giving a rat's ass what his naysayers think, the director has also continued to put women's feet front and center whenever possible, in his often can't miss tales. After keeping his foot fetish under wraps in Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction saw Mia Wallace's toes given much of the spotlight, before Uma Thurman attempting to wiggle those same digits was once again given a noticeable close-up in Kill Bill. And while the likes of Django Unchained and The Hateful Eight managed to pull back on the foot feature, Tarantino was back to his old tricks in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, giving just about every woman in the picture some time to spread their toes on the big screen. Whatever floats your boat, Quinton, mate. Number 2. J.J. Abrams' Lens Flare is for Life like all good things in life, there comes a point when you can simply have too much of said enjoyable entity. Look no further than J.J. Abrams' craving for a vibrant flash of light invading his shots at any given opportunity, as perhaps the most blatant example of this in all of modern cinema. What once was a rather quirky trademark of the Star Trek and Star Wars directors has quickly become a painful reoccurring instance that would leave many an audience member rather pissed should its usage ever be converted into a drinking game. Hilariously, Abrams himself has admitted in the past that his use of the glares across the lens can at times be too much, even confessing in 2013 to Crave Online that he had to hire industrial light and magic to erase some of his lens flare overindulgence in post-production on Star Trek Into Darkness. But as you've likely guessed by now, that still hasn't stopped JJ from obsessively lighting up our screens post Into Darkness, with the director flaring up The Force Awakens and Rise of Skywalker with a decent amount of his favorite toy too. Number 1. Christopher Nolan Won't Stop Making Bombastic Movies 
The words understated and subtle can rarely be applied to the work churned out by arguably the most bombastic director of his age. If the idea requires a larger-than-life scenario and people's minds to be melted literally and figuratively, then you can bet Christopher Nolan will be frothing at the mouth at the thought of it. And though there's undoubtedly always a place for a creator who finds pleasure in the practicality of cinema and challenging his audience, it's safe to say that in recent times not everyone has been fully on board the Nolan hype train. Features like Interstellar and Dunkirk that seemed more focused on unsettling his audience through theatre-shaking sound and making their eyes bleed with relentless IMAX sequences than giving them an enjoyable experience have left many pushing back against a filmmaker they once adored, pumping out a film that made those latter entries feel like brain-dead action flicks in the form of Tenet, a film so loud and frequently indecipherable that you likely need a week just to get over the ordeal. But if you thought his latest film was loud, wait till he's finished playing around with the father of the atom bomb. Yep, it's gonna get noisy. And that's our list. Know of any other movie directors who effing double down on your hate? Let us know all about them in the comment section right down below, and do not forget to like, share, and click on that subscribe button. Also, be sure to head on over to whatculture.com and find some more incredible articles just like the one this video you are watching is based on. I've been Gareth from whatculture.com. Thank you as always for clicking on this video today, and I'm sure I'll see you very, very soon. Bye-bye!